Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to our learning circle today. It's uh, Transforming Conflict Through Lateral Kindness with the Denise Findlay. Um, I'm Shauna Duncan. I'm Cree and English Ancestry. And um, today we're uh, honored to be working together on the unceded and occupied traditional territory of the Musqueam Nation. Um, Denise, it's awesome to have you back. This is great. This is my first time here, but not your first time here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've been here a few times. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody um, who recognizes me out there. I hope you're all... Hi. hi. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're all doing well. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Denise Finley. I am of Squamish ancestry, and uh, I own a company called Quite Quite Consulting, and so I've, for the past probably 10 or more years, I've been traveling around uh, BC and other parts of Canada working in a variety of capacities uh, with First Nations uh, communities and organizations and doing uh, facilitating and leading workshops on uh, predominantly lateral violence um, and today we're going to talk about lateral kind kindness and, and um, where that term has sort of been born from uh, and, I, and I've also uh, done a, a lot of work in the area of um, supporting people who work with children and understanding developmentally how, you know, we end up with problems with violence and addictions and things like that. So I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, I kind of feel at home here, although this is a different space <laughs> than I'm used to. So thank you. Yes, it's great to have you. And yes, again, welcome to everybody in video conference land and, and webinar land. It's great to have you all here. And, um, and we're going to get started now. We have some talking points to go over with Denise, and, and we'd love to have your input. If you have any questions, um, you want clarification or any input, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so Denise, what is lateral kindness? What does that mean? Well, it's a, a bit of, a, I think, a movement that has been started by the First Nations Health Directors Association. Uh, they had contacted me um, late last year and had asked if I uh, would be interested in putting my name forward to do some, some training uh, for the health directors for them. And uh, up until that point, I had been uh, focusing on the idea of lateral violence and what are the roots of violence and how do we make sense of intergenerational trauma and colonization and, and, and you know, how do we how do we make sense of, of why we have some of the problems that we have with with people being uh, hurtful towards one another even escalating towards violence and while I was doing that I was also uh, I'm just at the tail end of a master's degree at, in contemplative inquiry and approaches and a lot of what I was studying was around the mind heart connection and how do how do we develop whole people uh, that are morally good and um, ethical and um, compassionate. And so when they, when the uh, Health Directors Association contacted me and said, well, we would like you to frame it as lateral kindness, I thought, well, this is just meant to be. This is, a, this is an amazing fit. I can do that. And I had never thought of bridging the two, although I was already talking about that to begin with. Yeah. Um, but it's, I, I need to give credit where credit's due. It's the Health Directors Association that came up with that term, lateral <laughs> kindness. And I, and I think it's because people now want to start talking about not so much what the problem is, but what can we do about it and how do we start to, how do we start to transform violence into, into kindness. Yeah. You, know? you know, kindness is, a, is an enormous topic. It is not a new topic by any stretch. It, it, there are people in the world, um, you only have to think as far as, for instance, the Dalai Lama, that have been talking about kindness for a really long time and what that means, kindness and compassion. Um, I, I also believe that uh, indigenous life ways in the long ago, before contact, were that was just part of a life way, was, was kindness and compassion towards oneself and towards all other living creatures and uh, nature and the earth and animals. And so that was just, a, it was a life way that was built right in. Uh, and we certainly have, all the research shows us that we have 
we're each and every one of us born with the um, that innate potential to become moral mm -hmm. uh, creatures, mm -hmm. uh, to be kind to one another. So, so when I think about lateral kindness, kindness, it's how do we start to replace mm -hmm. some of the, how do we balance some of the acts of aggression and violence with acts of kindness? Mm -hmm. Um, how do we develop a practice of kindness or a culture of kindness in our workplaces, in our communities, in our families? And for some that may seem like an enormous daunting task considering the history and considering some of the, I guess, the complexity of the social, social problems that we see in our communities to this day. Um, but on my own journey so far I'm realizing that it very much starts with with us, with with our own self, uh, and developing that that relationship and to ourself and with ourself, and then being able to ripple that out and extend that out to other people. And there's certainly lots of practices that are that we can we can do to uh, develop. I think what I would call a disposition of kindness. Okay. There's things that we can do. Yeah. For example. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, for me, there you know some of the things that have worked is certainly my own um, my own meditation practice and um, connecting with what is sacred. I think in the world, uh, if we get and become consumed with all the things that aren't working and all the negativity, it takes us into a fairly, it can take us into a fairly dark place. And so for me, having a daily practice in which I am reminded of what is sacred uh, in the world, and, and that just means waking up some days and having a practice, just taking a moment to um, greet my day uh, and to, you know, be thankful for the fact that this, I get to see the sun come up uh, for another day to be grateful, to have a day to do good uh, throughout my day. But any kinds of um, practices that help us to form a deeper relationship with ourselves, whether it's meditative, whether it's through um, prayer or spiritual practice, whether it's through a connection to nature. Uh, I think nature is, um, for indigenous peoples, is so important because many moral. What I've learned, and it made perfect sense when I learned this, that all moral lessons were always tied to place. Okay. And so wherever, wherever our place um, is, wherever we come from, all of the stories, all of the moral teachings were tied to place. And so when people are removed from that place, we're disconnected from those stories. And so storytelling and um, sharing and reconnecting with place, I think, is really important as well. But these are all contemplative practices. Yeah. You know, drumming and singing, um, sitting in a circle together. So there, there's we can get as creative with that as pos as as we want to, but it really is returning to a more relational way of being as opposed to um, an individualistic orientation. Mm -hmm. Uh, where we're pursuing, we're pursuing prosperity, material goods, and success. Uh, it's it's returning to that more relational way of being on a regular basis and finding ways to incorporate that into our daily life. Whether it's in a family setting, in a community setting, in a workplace, that can be done. That can be done. So what I'm, I'm taking away from this is you're trying to say um, it starts internally. Mm -hmm with your own choices each day, how you look at that day, like how you practice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's the first place you start. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then it trickles over. Okay. And that's a discipline. Yes. You know, it, takes, it takes great discipline. I think it's really easy for us to, and the Dalai Lama would agree with that. He says that exact same thing. I think it's really easy to, to look out uh, uh, outside of ourselves and become externalized about this and say, well, you know, this has to happen and that has to happen. And when really what the most um, profound act, um, I think it's activism when we work on ourselves in this way. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't affect change out there unless we are, we are walking. We are walking that way ourselves. And, and that's been, for me, that lesson has been a hard one because it's been back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and externalizing and then having to go back inside and realizing yeah. that that's not the way. 
um, because society keeps us so busy, it's hard to stop and be in that moment and and have that as a practice. Yeah, yeah. it's very it, 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 society. Modern society is incredibly mm. distracting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> incredibly distracting. Yeah. It keeps us very very busy, um, but it also successfully supports us in um, something that I call othering. And uh, that's another term that, that comes from um, some different existential philosophers and some smart academics, and a lot of yeah, them are yeah. gone now. But uh, when, we, when we other um, that which is not like us, and, and we, we can't make room for it in our lives, so there may be people um, in our life that just, uh, they're so different than us that we can't, take them into our world, or maybe we don't want to take them into our world. Yeah. Um, I think what, what happens though is beautiful when we actually are, are woken up to some extent and we're able to start to perceive people in a different way, mm -hmm. um, and not so much as an other, for an other, but part of our reality, we're impacting them and they're impacting us. And I think when we're working in a community setting, the othering that goes on is probably, in my opinion, one of the main causes of suffering. There's a lot, it's all the fragmentation mm -hmm. and all the othering and, and factions that, that have developed. That's a good point. Yeah. I was wondering, maybe we should check in with um, people at video Questions. conference and webinar. Yeah. And I'm thinking about what they do as practices to, to uh, ground themselves mm -hmm. each day before they start. Does anybody have any input? Um, that would be great. We'd love to hear from you. What do you do to ground yourself each day? Anybody out there? Practices that people uh, have. Practices? <laughs> what do you do to make it through your day in a good way every, yeah. each and every day? It's hard. It's very difficult work, working in community. Does anybody meditate? One of the things that I do is um, I pray in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, I ask the Lord for His presence. And then the other thing I do is um, while at work, I put on the Gamma 40, the Isonic tones, and there's different uh, meditation tones that help. Um, it helps me learn, learn to concentrate. It makes me relax. And that's what I do. And that's Judy Charlie at Lake Awesome. Yeah, that's wonderful. It, it's, it's, you know, I, I call those things radical acts. It's the most radical act is to, is to work on oneself in relationship to, to the rest of the world. And we have a couple comments here. Um, we have someone who says they connect with na nature daily. Somebody else. Is lavender... A Aromatherapy on their commute. Oh, I love lavender. Uh, meditate and acknowledge gratitude. Uh, set a good intention for the day. Focus on the good. Skip the negative and don't take things personally when people lash out. Excellent. Um, somebody else says, I sing a song in the Cree language to start my day and I find this deeply grounding. Mm -hmm. That's so nice. nice. Yeah, I, I think when you're able to connect somehow with the sacred every single day of your life, um, that the world, our world expands and we expand and we're less likely to get caught up in the, in the little things. And then we can act um, from a place of greater good mm -hmm. when we're there. So we can respond in ways to some of the world's problems. I mean, there's big problems in the world, like not, not just mm -hmm. our communities, I mean, worldwide with globalization and how quickly things are moving and, and how um, the gap between the people who uh, have the wealth in the world uh, and the people that are completely impoverished just continues to widen and uh, you know it's easy for us to turn away from people who are um, suffering yeah. so to speak so it's anything that, that can allow us to be present and be with each and every person that we come into contact with during the day and act from that greater good, I think is that's good work. Mm -hmm. 
So I think our next uh, talking point is what is conflict and what, what, where are the roots of it? Where did the roots come from? <laughs> Uh, well, I think there's probably a lot. Of, I think there's probably a lot of different people with a lot of different opinions about what conflict is. Um, conflict is is a is a natural part of life and a perpetual part of life. And I think we can look at it a few different ways. Um, there's a fellow by the name of uh, Dr. John Gottman, who some of you probably have heard me mention him over over the years. Uh, but he basically has the largest um, collection of empirically based data on relationships. And he talks about conflict. Uh, and what he says about conflict is he says that I think it's over 80%, you know, actually, I think it's 60, 69%, but that could have changed, so don't okay. quote me, of conflicts are perpetual conflicts, which means that um, what we're fighting about in the first week of our relationship will be what we're fighting about 30 years from now. And anyone who's been in a long-term relationship knows that that's pretty much true. <laughs> that we argue about the same things over and over and over again. So he says that most conflicts are rooted in a difference in values. And when we attempt to change each other, that's where the perpetual, perpetual conflict comes from. We can't change each other. People are not willing to compromise their core values for another person. That is a process that has to come from the inside. Mm -hmm. if, I, if, if, if I learn and transform and change and my values evolve, it's not going to be because someone made me change. That just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so we're arguing about things that aren't worth arguing about. So he basically says that we have to work on accepting one another for who we are. And then we need to focus on working out conflicts that are solvable conflicts and not spend so much time focusing on the conflicts um, that are rooted in a difference in value systems. Because that will never work, basically. The other thing that he says, and, and I, I, I've try to live uh, some of these guidelines as much as I can. It says that uh, reduction in the use of toxins is really important. So it's not, he says it's not the people who argue and have conflict that um, are in trouble. He actually says it's the people who don't have conflict <laughs> that aren't doing well. Yeah. Yeah, avoiding conflict, people never resolve anything. They never talk about anything. They never work anything out. And on the other end of the spectrum, people who um, have high levels of toxicity during times of conflict, they're also in trouble in a different way. Uh, so he talks about the use of blame. Um, when we're arguing and in a conflict, whether it's between two people or a group of people, if we have a lot of blaming that's going on, that includes self-blame, um, that that's considered to be a toxin and it has in, an impact on our physiological health. Like he actually measures people's heart rates and blood pressure. Um, that's how he's done his research is he's, he's monitored uh, people's physiological responses to these things. So blame being something that the heart rate increases, the blood pressure increases. Uh, and in, I'm just going to ask, if the, the next toxin is a response to blame. How do we respond when we feel like we're being accused or blamed unfairly? What's our most natural response to that? Let's see if someone can, I know you all know the answer to this. <laughs> what, what is it? Seeing the heads nodding. Anybody want to? Uh, give it a try. Yeah, give it a try. Can you ask the question again? Who, when, when, when we feel blamed or accused unfairly or we're, there's a character assassination coming at us, what is the natural response to that? We become what? Someone from Lake Bean has their hand up. Defensive? Yeah, yes. we become defensive. And so that's the next toxin that comes in. And Gottman says that these are like, they're, he calls them the four horsemen of the apocalypse because once one comes in, the others come galloping right behind, and we we don't even know we're in it, and then we're all we're all having a conflict steeped in these toxins, and it's going nowhere. And what's happening is people's feelings are getting hurt, and we're getting triggered, and we're getting flooded, and our body and our brain can only take so much. So the toxins are blame, defensiveness, 
um, which is a natural response to blame. And I always say to people, if you start to feel defensive, chances are some, there's an accusation somewhere. It could be implied or it could be direct. Um, the other two are contempt and stonewalling. And contempt is really when you can no longer see any positive qualities in the other. When you look at them, you can't find one thing that you like about the person. That's contempt. And that's a toxin. Yeah, and, and I mean that happens, and then what eventually happens is you get to the fourth, fourth uh, toxin, which is called stonewalling, and that really happens when your body's had enough, and you see the person, and I know I've had that experience where you just, you no longer have any internal resources to deal with the situation, you, you are afraid of being triggered and flooded and having the experience of blame, defensiveness and contempt. And so what you do is you withdraw yourself from the situation and you actually stop uh, talking to the person. It's different than, um, and I've been asked this question before, it's different than excluding somebody, it's different than shunning. Stonewalling is a response to enough, I can't handle this. And in his research, I don't like to genderize, but in his research he shows that men are more likely to get to stonewalling before women. And I know in my own relationship that to be true. So my husband, <laughs> my husband will definitely check out before me. I'll be behind him still arguing and he's done. He can't take anymore. He's flooded. And so we can see this happening all over the place. And so what he recommends is that we start to become acutely aware of these toxins and we, we start to reduce the use of them. And you can do that by just laying them out on the table before any conversation and saying, we're going to be mindful of this and we're going to try to avoid the use of these. And if we start to get into this, we're going to pause and we're going to take a break and we're going to come back and we're, try, we're going to try again without them. If you can develop awareness around them, um, then you can have constructive conflict if those four things aren't part of it. The other thing is, is that when, you, when we look at transformational theory, change theory, we look at uh, quantum physics and the way that the world comes into being, conflict is an important part of that. We have to have polarization and we have to have opposites. We have to have that to exist in the world. It's paradoxical. So there's always going to be opposite ends. It's not about getting rid of that. It's about how we navigate it. And so if I can look at somebody, uh, the other, and I can say, I don't get that person at all. I don't get where they're coming from. They make no sense to me. They agitate me. I couldn't find a person more different than I am. But can I open my mind to at least try to understand and seek to understand where that person is coming from, as opposed to jumping quickly into the toxins and quickly into shutting that person out. And that takes discipline and effort. There's someone with their hand up. Yes, would you like to share? Uh, no, I'm not sure. Just a question. Can you name the four horsemen again? Yes. The four horsemen um, are blame, defensiveness, contempt, and stonewalling. And you can look up on YouTube and uh, Dr. John Gottman, and I have a resource list that I've provided that you'll have access to, and the website's on there. Yeah. Uh, he actually has an app for your iPhone that uh, gives you tips and whatnot that can be really fun to use. Uh, the other thing that he talks about in terms of conflict is, is that it, like, it's not about getting rid of the conflict, it's about doing the conflict more skillfully, it's about having conflict around the things that you can affect change on and not arguing to change one another. He talks about acts of positivity and increasing positivity. And in his research, he says that if you have five acts of, of positivity or kindness, to every one negative, that you're actually going to be in good shape. You're, you'll have uh, re resiliency in the relationship, and this applies to couples, parents and children, and um, organizations, teams of people working together. And that's why we actually have to take the time. I think we have to have rituals, either daily, weekly, um, whatever you can manage, where we're building relationship and positivity and practicing talking about things with each other outside of conflict. I think we live in such a busy world and I think that the, the um, 
I'm going to use the, the sort of Western philosophical approach to life is productivity based, and unless we're unless it helps the bottom line, it's worthless. Whereas I really feel we have to have rituals where we where we work on our relationships outside of conflict, because what we do is we wait until a conflict happens, and then we're scrambling in a reactive mode, and often it's too late. The damage has been done because we're just so busy trying to get the work done and trying to be productive. Yeah. And that's at the cost mm -hmm. of the human capital, which is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're recommending basically, uh, number one is working on your yourself, running yourself internally. And the yes. next is when there is conflict, it's okay, but um, making sure you're doing it in a good way. Yeah, and you can talk about that you can you can get together and you can say okay like how how do we want to have conflict when it comes up what are some of the what are some of the things that come up on a regular basis what are what do we tend to get into conflict about and now let's plan ahead of time so that we're more likely to respond in the way that we want to respond and i think that we we have the elephant in the room too often everyone's feeling it everyone's sitting on it but no one's really talking about it and it grows and grows and grows to the point where it it can become unmanageable. And then um, it can be really hard to repair when it gets to that place. Really hard to prepare. So I say prevention is the best medicine where this stuff is concerned. Absolutely. Making relationships a priority is, is if we have solid relationships, the work gets done. Yeah. So practicing ahead of time as a group? Yeah, for instance, in the work environment, how do we pause and encourage each other? Focusing on that instead of some of the challenges. I think spending time um, appreciating each other is a wonderful way of doing. Spending time doing check-in where you're actually hearing not about work but how people are, how people are doing, um, what they need, and and being able to practice having conversations when things go wrong because it's a slippery slope. And I I know exactly what happens is that. One little thing happens, and it's a little thing, but it kind of, you know, it, it goes in, and you say, well, I'm going to, you know, mm -hmm. I'm going to push that aside, and then the other little thing, and there's this buildup of things that we're not okay with that we sit on, we're not addressing directly, and then it, it, then it breaks down at some point, and so, you know, finding time to be in relationship, practicing talking to each other about things. Uh, difficult things. Talking about the way you handle conflict usually. You can sit in, a, in any organization, each one has a unique personality. So you can look at your team, your organization, your family, and say, how do we handle conflict here? Do we avoid it? Are people fighting all the time? Is there gossiping going on? What's going on and how do we start to change this? And how do we start to respond in a way that is, is kinder, more compassionately? Um, that's going to keep people intact, that's going to strengthen the relationship as opposed to break it down. And this is not ideal, like, I'm not idealistic about this. This is not easy and there's, there's lots of peaks and valleys and bumps on the road. It takes a huge amount of discipline um, to be able to, to work through these kinds of things. Some of us hate conflict and will do anything to avoid it. Whereas other people are going at it all the time um, so how could we use lateral kindness to uh, heal our relationships? Well, that's a, that's, a, that's I think we first, um, you know, I'm rather philosophical, so I'm always, you know, thinking out here, and I, I think first of all we have to understand for ourselves what kindness is, and why it's important, and we have to make our own personal meaning. Um, of it because I think in our minds sometimes when we've been done wrong we don't feel that that person is deserving of kindness <laughs> yeah. because they've done us wrong and so we have to we have to really open up the way we're seeing this because when we harbor um, I'm going to read you a little passage from one of my writings but when we harbor um, those grudges and we withhold forgiveness and we withhold kindness, it's us that carries it. 
it, not the other person. Mm -hmm. It's we carry that. And so it, it, it's, you do it for yourself. You extend the kindness for yourself. You, you forgive for yourself, not, not for the other person. They may not be deserving. Maybe they did something terrible. Maybe they don't deserve it. But it, it, we, do, we, we must do this for our own self so we can grow um, and uh, grow, beyond, grow beyond that, that, sacred, that sacredness that I'm talking about. And how are we walking through our life? in this human world where people are so fallible and there's so many temptations and people are making mistakes all the time. How do we bring a sense of that sacredness in? There's a wonderful film, if anyone is interested, and it's by a guy, it's by a, I think you can go to the National Film Board to watch it. Uh, it's called Scared Sacred by a fellow whose name is Velcro Ripper. It's a crazy name. And he goes all over the world to like ground zero the places in the world where there's absolute like violence and destruction and awful things happening. And he goes to these places to seek out what is sacred there. And he goes to these places to see people who lived through the most horrific of ordeals to see how they still are able to find that which is sacred and find the joy and the beauty in life uh, and, and still maintain their um, that innate morality for good, for goodness, for kindness. It's a great, um, a great film. Yeah, I recommend yeah. that. I recommend that for sure because it's amazing. It's amazing to see what can happen. There's someone from it's no, it's two. It's two hours, and I. I mean, I had to watch it in two one-hour segments mm -hmm. because I'm so busy with my little guys and everything. But yeah, it's uh, it, it's just amazing to see what can be born out of. And we, you know, I, we know this because we know with our elders, some of them that have lived through atrocities, and yet they have maintained that good heart, and they are the most kind gentle human beings and they can extend themselves in such a way and they've been able to forgive that there's you know this is a journey that we're all really walking on is to come back to this place with each other uh, and we, we walk a personal journey with that but then we also walk get the collective journey together with that and I think we have we have to continue to talk about how to find a way um, with it, but I, we have to understand kindness, kindness for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna. Do, is it okay if I read a little? Would that be okay? Okay, I'm gonna read a little bit of. Um, I I did a uh, a bit of writing for a course I was in uh, last year, that was. Um, the writing itself was a collection of some of my life stories and and. Um, how the lived experience is deeply pedagogical, which means that we each walk our own path, and there's deep learning that happens in our, from birth to death for each and every one of us. And so I'm going to read you this piece because it speaks to my learning around forgiveness and um, compassion and how that's been born out of, out of difficulty. Okay. I'll try not to cry. You don't, you don't oh, cry die. out of oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So. Um, growing up without a mother and father is excruciatingly difficult. My mother's name was Shirley and she was killed in a random accident when she was 21 and I was only 16 months young. My maternal grandmother was caring for me at the time of the accident and I remained with her on and off until she died when I was 19 years old. At a young age I was thrust into a world of trauma, inconsolable grief and anger. My maternal grandmother and my mother's four sisters raised me. Although they did the best they could, I would describe my childhood somewhat like being passed around like a football. Lots of fumbling and dropping of the ball and without much care and nurturing. I was just a body, a reminder of the loss of someone they loved and part of a family they despised. Needless to say, I got a little beat up along the way. Rejection, betrayal, shame, and loss became my teachers. Relentless ones at that. As a child, I toughened up pretty darn quick. I figured out that I had to take care of myself emotionally. 
I learned to conceal, take care of others emotionally, and never allow myself to be vulnerable. Mostly I learned that I could not count on anybody. For many years I suffered. I became my own worst enemy and took up the role of rejecting, shaming, and betraying myself. What I didn't know was that these experiences were teaching me something. My spirit was being strengthened in preparation for my journey, preparing me for the work I do today as a mother, in my community, and as an educator. Who I am today is largely because of these excruciating experiences. Loss led to the development of an incredible capacity for adaptation and resiliency. Betrayal taught me that loyalty and honor and trust were values I could never compromise. Shame affected me the same way that pressure turns coal into a diamond and rejection forced me to go inside to develop a relationship with myself. My capacity for forgiveness seems unreasonable to many who prefer to hold a grudge. Loss comes when we least expect it. She has gifts, gifts to offer if we can bear the vulnerability, if we can stay open enough to receive them. I cannot remember much from the earliest losses, but deep within me is an existential insecurity wanting to be healed. Life without a mother leaves one with no fixed address in the world. At least for me, it seemed this way. Since then, I have experienced many losses and a spiritual capacity was born. I somehow have held on to my mother even though I did not know her. I feel her watching over me, protecting me. I believe her spirit nurtured me, and as a result, I developed a capacity to know things that others in my family did not. My senses were attuned to something far greater than myself. This is a gift I carry to this day. So, so I, I just share that because my capacity for understanding kindness has been a journey um, where I had to be kind to myself first and foremost. I had to know it intimately and deeply within my own self before I could ever think of teaching it to somebody else. And I, and I don't even think we can teach it. It's a capacity we must develop in ourselves. We must know it in the deepest of ways. And when we know it, we can extend it out to others regardless of what their circumstances are. It transcends all the judgments we have um, about the other. So I'm thinking of the way you were talking about, uh, of course, internally first, but then preventing, preventing, preventing these um, conflicts. So do you have any examples that you could give of preventative ways, whether it be in communities or in the work environment? Well, I, I think, first of all, it's not always about preventing it. It's about preparing for it. And um, so I know I use the term prevent, mm -hmm. but I think also um, preparing for it, which means that we agree to consciously work on having tough conversations and developing our relationships outside of conflict. So we don't wait for the conflict. We actually practice extending kindness to one another. We practice appreciating one another. And then, you know, once we've sit, we've sat, I mean, what I would actually, if you want me to tell you what I think people should do, is you should have a regular practice as often as possible. Whatever, um, whatever your uh, context will allow for, where you sit in a circle, you get to know each other outside of work. You have honest check-in with each other where, where there's a, a potential for you to share. And then you talk about some of the conflicts you see happening and the way that that's being done. And then you talk about how you want to be different in that. And you start to envision and reimagine how you are being together. And I think having a vision for that is really, really important. Mm -hmm. I think if we don't imagine what's possible, we can't work towards it. Do you see? If we only just look at our circumstances now, and we, we build from that, it's really hard to create anything new. Mm -hmm. And so you need to talk about together what would it look like in the future? Um, how, would we be, how would we be together as a group, as a community? How would conflict, how would we be um, engaging in differences of opinion with each other? And here's the thing too, is uh, there's a lot of conflict that happens um, 
in the periphery because of the voices that are silenced. And I would almost be more um, concerned about that because there's a lot of rumblings that go unnoticed underneath with the folks that feel they can't find their voice. You probably are already aware of that, right? And so how do you bring people in um, to the circle to find their voice? And you need to develop a relationship first for that. You need to create safety. And once people start to share, then you can start to get a full picture. It's kind of like trying to build a puzzle with half the pieces missing. You're never going to see the whole picture because half the pieces are missing, half the voices are missing. So I'm wondering, people on webinar and uh, video conference, are you doing anything in your workplace, in your family, in your community that um, helps you to deal with conflict in a healthy way? Anybody want to give any input? We talked about it personally, but now how are you practicing? So that you're having healthy relationships with one another. Do you do circles together? Do you have check-ins with one another? Um, and it's okay if you don't, and it's okay to say that you don't, um, because there's just not room for that. <laughs> but I think it, it, it's a conversation. Um, I just don't think that it's possible to create um, compassion and kindness if if it's only connected to the bottom line, if it's only connected to productivity, uh, it, 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 it can't, and you see that in organizations now uh, where they bring someone in for wellness, but it's for productivity. Let's make sure our employees are well so they can keep producing for us. Versus Wellness as a life way, kindness as a life way, and that is different, having those practices, not connected to necessarily productivity. It's, it's a change that needs to take place in the world, and there's, um, I've met, I mentioned globalization earlier, but with globalization has also come a new awareness and a new movement in this regard where people are saying, we're aware that this isn't working, that, that the world is not in a good place, that people are not well. Um, we have to return, we have to return to um, a different way and that in many cases uh, the rest of the world is looking at indigenous life ways for those answers about how do we sustain balance and harmony. Mm -hmm. we, uh, Millie Price has put down, provide switch switchback training for all staff, and I'm, I'm curious, Millie, um, could you elaborate on that more? I'd love to hear more about that. She's in webinar. So it sounds like you're doing something already in the workplace to make sure that... Um, yeah, I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, is anybody else doing something similar? Any training as a group? Or any practices as a group? Okay. Oh, someone was on. Somebody on? Somebody trying to speak? We'd love to hear from you. <laughs> Just turn the mic on if you want to speak and let us know. Yeah, you yeah, do yeah. it. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, every 
every Monday you guys do that. That's great. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and that's positivity building, and so that's what, what it does is it strengthens the relationship so much so that when a conflict does arise, it doesn't it doesn't break the relationship down. But if the relationships are fragile and a conflict comes up, it breaks down pretty quick. So that's that's what I would say the preventative work is mm -hmm. is the positivity building. And then when the conflicts do happen, it's about doing it differently. Mm -hmm. Becoming aware of the patterns and then, and then approaching it in a way that is, is not hurtful. So Millie has written in and she said, um, it's a fa fascinating process of understanding how our stored memories form our core values and how our core values direct our thoughts and ultimately produce the action by which we are judged. Yeah. So that's what they do as a team. No, the training. The training, yeah. She was talking about, we were asking what the training was. Yeah. And so she was describing Yeah, so that's the training. training that they do in their workplace, yeah. Um, that's a good point too because, I mean, our past conditioning, we have to become aware of it in order to change it. And often we're not aware of what our past conditioning, uh, how that impacts us in our day to day. There's a, a wonderful story about uh, that I'll tell. It's about a, um, a barracuda which was in captivity, and barracudas are one of the most ferocious fish you know, out there. Mm -hmm. And so this particular barracuda was in captivity, and it was in a plexiglass tank, and um, it was used for experimentation. Unfortunately, it's a true story. But they had the barracuda on one side, and then they had a plexiglass divider down the middle and on the other side of the plexiglass divider they put a flounder which is what the barracudas eat flounder and uh, that's their main source of, of sustenance and so the barracuda repeatedly would try to get the flounder and it would ram its head into this plexiglass divider repeatedly until it finally stopped doing that it finally stopped trying to get to the flounder. And so what then what they did was they took the plexiglass divider out of the tank and guess what happened because of the conditioning? That that the, the barracuda had been conditioned. What do you think happened? What was the end of that how did that story end? Anybody have any input? What do you think happened? Any I guesses? saw an eyebrow raise there in your queue. <laughs> <laughs> Just before the monsters. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, you're yeah, you're right. In fact, it stopped even trying. It stopped even trying and it starved to death. Wow. And that's how conditioning works. Yeah. So it, becoming aware of our own conditioning. Becoming, uh, having our own awareness of our own self and why we are the way we are is part of transforming that mm -hmm. and how we see the world and, and what we see as possible or not possible. And I think we really need as many people in our communities that are visioners, that, that are interested in, in rewriting the mythology and the narratives of our communities, that are, that are imaginaries and that want to reimagine and believe in, the, in, in what that might look like in the future. I think we, we are very conditioned to look at what our circumstances are and then to be reacting from that place. Uh, but we really need to be looking, and we need to get up onto the top of the mountain to see the bigger picture. Yeah. We have one more comment from Fiona. Oh, just before that, there's May. We May before that, and so go up a little bit. Great, and Millie. Oh, Maeve. Oh, Maeve works primarily online, and she said one of the big problems is uh, using uh, the online is um, things can be, um, you don't understand the tone, you miss some, some under, misunderstand things because it can't be conveyed properly through text. Mm -hmm. And um, so she's saying that's important issues need to be discussed, and um, so sometimes it's an issue. Mm -hmm. using the online. Yeah. 
Well, I and then you have to have face to face or phone in yeah. there. You have to connect person, so it can't always be in that space. I just don't think that technology is a replacement for a real human connection. It never will be. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful tool. Uh, it makes our life efficient. We can get lots done. We can. It's it's a miracle. We can talk to people instantaneously in, on the other side of the world. It's it's unbelievable what we can do. But it's not a replacement for for what happens when we have face to face human connection and all the chemicals that are released mm -hmm. and um, being able to see someone's uh, body language, their facial expression, that their, their eyes making eye contact and and we. I, I think we need to always remember that we are we are creatures of connection, contact, closeness. We're social creatures. We need this. Again, the technology is amazing. And when I travel, I can certainly connect with my kids. It's wonderful that they can see me and I can say goodnight to them. But it's nothing like having a hug and, and being in the same room with them. Uh, so I think we have to be careful with how much we begin to rely on um, the technology mm -hmm. for our relationships. So my dad, now to Fiona, she said that their staff recently adopted a practice of doing a wellness check-in at their monthly meeting. Um, and uh, So they take time for each staff member to share something of their choice and so far it's been going really well and they've been having uh, positive feedback. Nice. And uh, she's very interested in how to bring the silent voices to the circle. I think that's wonderful. Good for you. I love hearing. I love hearing that people are are um, incorporating practices like this. You know, the, the silent voices are hard to draw out, and they can easily be marginalized. Uh, so it's all about creating safety and talking about how to create safety. Having even group agreements, or I hate the word norms, but group agreements. Um, and having people take risks in the group in terms of vulnerability and putting themselves out there will increase mm -hmm. uh, the safety in the group so that the people that maybe aren't uh, feeling comfortable to talk eventually will. They need opportunity, they may need to be encouraged and drawn out, they may need some help, uh, and it may take time and we need to be patient, but I think we should never assume that because someone doesn't say something, they have nothing to say. I have learned that it's the people who say the least that often have the most to say. And, and when they finally do speak, it can be quite profound. They're sitting there quietly for years and then finally they say something that blows my mind. I'm like, wow, that person's been taking every single thing in over the years and they have such an interesting perspective. So I, I think we need to be paying attention, um, and I think sometimes, uh, and I know I'm guilty of this, we can get into hearing our own selves talk, and um, anxious for our next turn to talk, and reacting and responding to what's happening, as opposed to allowing the space for everyone to speak, which means sometimes allowing for uncomfortable silence. <laughs> and being able to hold that and hold the tension of that. Um, there, there has to be a bit of a tension created for a transformation to happen. I just, um, I learned a new term this past week. As opposed to intention, if we look at the word as intention. Mm. So we've, we're in tension and if you think about playing a musical instrument or a guitar with strings if it's too loose it won't work and if it's too tight it won't work you have to create the right amount of tension and then when you've got the right amount of tension you can of course strike a chord and you, you can create a song and it's the same way in groups there has to be intention there um, and someone has to be contributing to the creation of that. Hopefully it would be everyone in the group, but someone has to take ownership over creating that container and that intention for the group. I like that metaphor. <laughs> intention, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Linda asks, how do you handle people who talk for others? <laughs> that happens a lot. <laughs> um, 
Well, and so, you know, it, it, in ceremony, right, if we have someone speak for us, that's legit. Right. right? Sometimes in ceremony, we have speakers to say something that's really important because it's too, we, it's too emotional or for whatever reason, we need someone to be our voice. And that's one thing. That's in ceremony and in the right context. So I want to I want to make sure I mention that because I'll have people tell me, well, in ceremony we do this. Yes, I know. Um, and I think that that's a wonderful practice. I've had to have people speak for me in ceremony because I it's just too emotional and I can't find the words. Um, but people who speak for others, um, I think we have to ask ourselves what their intention is. Um, are they, are they drawing in other people's voices to build their own case? Do they not feel that they can ask for what they need without, it's called third party, third party, we call that. When we, when we bring in, well, or we'll have some people say, well, everyone in the community feels that way, or everybody in the office feels that way, or so-and-so also feels that way. So what I encourage is that People speak for themselves, and I teach people about what third partying is. It's called third party power, and I talk about it. I say third party power happens when we don't feel enough confidence or strength within our own selves to say what we need to say or ask for what we want to ask for, and so we need to bring in the third parties behind us in order to, to ask. But now we're implicating other people, and that's not fair. And so it's, it's a problem with power because people don't feel they have the power to speak directly and so they bring in others. And so I teach them about that. I talk about that and I say, if you have something to say, you need to speak for yourself. And if you need help speaking for yourself, ask for the help to speak for yourself and let other people speak for themselves. Because on the other end, you also have people that third party because by going to that person that you know they know has a big mouth and they go to that person knowing that that person is going to say everything that they can't say and and this is how gossip gets spread as well and so one one of the things I encourage leaders to do is you know if you start on a path of transforming some of some of these dynamics and you have a vision for what you want to create in the workplace in the health center in the community one of the first one of the first requests i would make of people is this it's very very simple i i would say one of the first things i'm trying to do is i'm trying to empower people to find their own voices i'm trying to reduce the amount of gossip that goes on because it's hurtful and confusing and so what I'm asking people to do is speak for themselves and if you have something to say I'm going to encourage you to go directly to the person to speak to them about it first if you need help with that I will help you with that um, but I want people as much as possible to be having direct conversations and that's where that's where a safe container in a group can help if people know that they get together once a week and it's safe and that they can they can voice their thoughts and opinions there you're going to have less of that out there but if there's nowhere for that to happen it's going to be happening all over the place because people just we verbally work things out that's how we do it we verbally work things out so so what if things have gone so far down the road how can you even start to begin to create safety when things are so unsafe. Mm -hmm. So even a circle is yeah. unsafe. Well, I so, think, yeah, it, it's a good question because that happens a lot, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. I think when it's gone so far, you have to, first of all, ask yourselves if people are willing to work it through and genuinely willing. And then you have to break it down. So you have to actually start working on conflicts one-on-one -on -one in isolation with people before you can bring people back together. Yeah. Because, you know, if you have people that are in an entrenched conflict, bringing that into the group, no one feels safe in the group anymore. No. Yeah. So that, that is how I do it. Is, and, well, and in the work I've done in this regard, generally I like to start to work with the leader 
and then sort out the relationships between leader and all the staff, and then you start to bring the staff together who have conflicts, and you start to work on those conflicts. And so what you're doing is you're building up to bring the group together. It's called third-party power, and I talk about it. I say third-party power happens when we don't feel enough confidence or strength within our own selves to say what we need to say or ask for what we want to ask for, and so we need to bring in the third parties behind us in order to, to ask. But now we're implicating other people and that's not fair. And so it's, it's a problem with power because people don't feel they have the power to speak directly and so they bring in others. And so I teach them about that. I talk about that and I say, if you have something to say, you need to speak for yourself. And if you need help speaking for yourself, ask for the help to speak for yourself and let other people speak for themselves. Because on the other end, you also have people that third party, because by going to that person that know, they know has a big mouth, and they go to that person knowing that that person's gonna say everything that they can't say. And, and this is how gossip gets spread as well. And so one, one of the things I encourage leaders to do is, you know, if you start on a path of transforming some of some of these dynamics and you have a vision for what you want to create in the workplace, in the health center, in the community, one of the first one of the first requests I would make of people is this. It's very, very simple. I, I would say one of the first things I'm trying to do is I'm trying to empower people to find their own voices. I'm trying to reduce the amount of gossip that goes on because it's hurtful and confusing and so what I'm asking people to do is speak for themselves and if you have something to say I'm going to encourage you to go directly to the person to speak to them about it first if you need help with that I will help you with that um, but I want people as much as possible to be having direct conversations and that's where that's where a safe container in a group can help if people know that they get together once a week and it's safe and that they can, they can voice their thoughts and opinions there, you're going to have less of that out there. But if there's nowhere for that to happen, it's going to be happening all over the place. Because people just, we verbally work things out. That's how we do it. We verbally work things out. So, so what if things have gone so far down the road, how can you even start to begin to create safety when things are so unsafe? So even a circle is yeah. unsafe. Well, I so, think, yeah, it, it's a good question because that happens a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. I think when it's gone so far, you have to, first of all, ask yourselves if people are willing to work it through and genuinely willing. And then you have to break it down. So you have to actually start working on conflicts one-on-one -on -one in isolation with people before you can bring people back together. Yeah. Because, you know, if you have people that are in an entrenched conflict, bringing that into the group, no one feels safe in the group anymore. No. Yeah. So that, that is how I do it. Is, and, well, and in the work I've done in this regard, generally I like to start to work with the leader and then sort out the relationships between leader and all the staff, and then you start to bring the staff together who have conflicts, and you start to work on those gone. And so what you're doing is you're building up to bring the group together uh, if it's gone that far. And that's been a successful strategy in a lot, in a lot of cases, but that's a longer term Goal. piece of work. It, it's not overnight. It takes commitment to work through that. It could take a year, depending on the size of an organization. And then I guess yeah. finding a place where there is some agreement you know, there's, what there's can people be, agree on? Right? Yeah. There's got to be something that you can work on that. Absolutely. There's some agreement. Yeah. Well, and I think if you can, um, if people can agree on why they show up at work every day, mm -hmm. um, that's really, that's an important step. Because we're not always going to agree with each other, we're not always going to like each other, but we agree on the importance of the work and we agree on how the work should be getting done. Well, that's, that's, Something, mm -hmm. right? Something, stuff yeah. in the right direction. So how can we use lateral kindness to grow resiliency in our communities? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That's a big one. Well, I think that we have a lot of resiliency in our communities uh, already. I think that people are, are very resilient. And I, I think that one of the reasons 
that indigenous people are so resilient is there is because of the spirituality and, and the emotion. And I, and I think that we are deeply emotional people that feel things deeply, um, all things, and there's a connection to all things. And, and I think that there, there's a vulnerability there in that, and that that is, that and the connection to the sacred and the spirituality um, gives birth to a resiliency that has kept us going for as long as, as we have under the circumstances. Kindness, I, I think, I think that kindness can create a kind of safety in which people are actually free to bring their guard down. And I think if people are having to walk around with their guard up all the time because they're afraid, that we become hardened. That's we armor. And, and you know, for the large part, we have to do that in many contexts in our lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we go out to the world, and the world is not a kind place in, in generally. We have to armor. and. Um, when we armor and we become hardened, there is actually a loss of resiliency. And when I when I talk about, let's talk about my a definition of resiliency that I use. I'm when I'm talking about resiliency, I'm actually talking about neuroplasticity. I'm talking about the brain's ability to repair, to adapt, to grow, and and how quickly we can move through things in our life, when, when life throw, gives us lemons, <laughs> mm -hmm. or, um, you know, which it does often, or there's an obstacle, or there's a challenge, um, resiliency is born when we can feel deeply, when we can cry about it, when we can feel the hurt, feel the disappointment, when we can feel all the tough emotions. Mm -hmm. Those emotions move us through the experience, and when we come out the other side, we have adapted, and the, you can see uh, change in um, the structure in the brain. And so, resiliency and emotion are are intrinsically connected. There's a symbiosis there, um, and I think that if we're living in a kinder, gentler society, if our disposition is one of kindness that we can make room for people to heal. People feel safe. They can actually be vulnerable. They can, they can feel their emotions. Whereas if we're living in a, in, a, in a world of violence and harshness, where we're always feeling that we have to armor, there's no room for adaptation. There's room, it's only survival, not adaptation. And I, I think, I think it was Wayne Dyer that I went and saw him years ago at the at Queenie Theater, gee, before I had my second son. And I remember him, I drive my husband, he hated it. He said, like, oh, I got to sit for this, right? But um, I think he said something about how we're meant to be most natural. And he said, you know, we're like a, like a, you know, a stick that is, when, it, when a tree is alive and a branch is alive, it's bendable and it's pliable. And it's resilient. And then, you know, when the tree when the tree dies and atrophies, it cracks. And he likened this to what can happen when we harden. That's a survival mode, and that's not resiliency. That's not adaptability. That's that's toughening up and weathering through and um, becoming hardened. And that's not the birthplace of resiliency. The birthplace of resiliency is in our vulnerability. It's in our, it's in our ability to feel deeply. It's in our ability to cry and to, to still show up in life. Uh, there's, a, there's a guy by the name of John Kabat-Zinn who has written a lot of books on mindfulness-based meditation, stress reduction, and things like that. And, um, I, I actually was in school. Um, this past weekend and I haven't been going to school consistently because my husband was recently he became very very uh, ill and so I've taken time off to take care of my family but 
of course, people wanted a check-in at school because they haven't seen me. So we did our check-in and I talked about um, how scared I was in the beginning and how I've adapted and how I realized that that this is life and I want to show up for it. I don't want to shrink away and I don't want to harden to it. And I said, I like what John Kabat-Zinn says. He says, I want to be present for the whole catastrophe. <laughs> and I said to the group, I said, this is, it's hard, it's excruciating, but it's my life, it's part of my journey and I want to be here for the whole catastrophe. And that's the type of person I want to be. I don't want to shrink away from it. I don't want to harden to it. I want to walk alongside. I want to walk, go through it and walk through it. And, mm -hmm. and that to me is resiliency. Yeah. yeah. And there's a, there's, a, there's a kindness in that to my own self, to, to my family, to my husband, and, and, a, and a very firm belief that we are always being carried by spirit. Spirit is loving and kind and it is carrying us always, always, always carrying us. Is there any questions or comments uh, that anybody would like to share? We'd love to hear from you. Hi Denise, Mary Knowles here. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to you um, for reminding me the thing about keeping up soften. Uh, it's, uh, it's an important reminder in the work that we do. And it's really a pleasure to hear you. Um, all of us up at the Lake of the Nation really enjoyed this. Uh, we missed the first session and we're hoping we can get a copy of that webinar too. Thank you very much. Nice to see you and hear you, Mary. Yes, thank you. A blast from the past there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, from <laughs> yeah. Are there any other comments? We'd love to hear from you. Or questions? Any questions? She says we need to think. To, we need to stop thinking about conflict as good or bad, and rethink it as a way to heal. Yeah, it's necessary. I, I like I like that. I like that a lot. And and what it made me think of is that we have internal conflict, right? And how how we're doing this internal conflict is often how we do conflict out here as well. And so becoming aware of what those internal conflicts are and working, working with that piece allows us to um, meet those external conflicts in a way that is more congruent. Um, and we are less likely to become triggered and reactive. So just noticing it because, again, getting to know yourself in that way. And when we know ourselves and our feet are firmly planted in the ground, boy, I tell you, we can meet we can meet life in a way that is quite incredible. The human spirit just is, it's amazing. Uh, Tanya, I'll just read what she's written. It's hard to promote kindness when, when many community members, or, oops, just skipped a bit, sorry can't see past the negative or aren't willing to look at their own behavior that keeps the lateral violence alive. Yeah, yeah it's true. It is tough. It, it is tough. We are surrounded by a lot of people in the world that are, are going in an opposite direction. Um, never underestimate um, the power of your ability to vision um, a new reality and to reimagine uh, what that might look like and living in alignment with that, with that vision and that new imagined reality. Whether it's you, just you or you and a small group of people, 
how powerful that is. I think that we feel that everything has to be done instrumentally and so we look around and, and we look at the circumstance and we look at the overwhelming evidence in the world that it's pretty much falling apart. And then we say, like I tap out, I can't, I can't do anything. It's too much. And I think if we stay focused there, we suffer greatly. Um, we have to remember how truly powerful we are. And all of the science today in terms of quantum physics tells us that indigenous people in the long ago had it right, mm -hmm. which means that what we think and how we vision creates reality and how our thought process actually what manifests tomorrow is a result of what we thought yesterday or last week. And so changing the way we see things and changing the way we think about things and changing those conversations, never underestimate power of that and you have to start small you have to start with yourself uh, I've spent two years studying this that and, and I, I see if I started way out there I, I wouldn't have been able to do it that would have been too much but I started with myself and I started with the small things and when I started to see the changes occurring in my own life and in people around me because of my daily practice and my daily commitment to believe in something that was not yet visible that's how I was able to start manifesting change. And we need more people who are engaged in these processes. Because like I said, if we look out there at the world, oh man, is it ever overwhelming. We will feel small and insignificant as if we can do nothing, and that is disempowering. But never underestimate the power that your thought has on your reality. It is huge, and indigenous people have always known this. That's why we did visioning, and we did vision quests. And we had mythologies. That's why, why we have that. So a lot of it's related to our cultural practices. Mm -hmm. Individually taking that commitment and then as communities, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Don't, yeah, don't let the actions of, of another person stop you from um, using your imagination um, to you know, reimagine, dream up a, a new reality for your community and your organization and start with, just start with yourself every single day and dream up and imagine and vision how you want your day to be and watch what happens when you can stay focused on that. There's all sorts of, there's, I wanted to, do I have time to share it, just hold up some of these books? Yeah, we've got it, yes. A few questions, okay. So th there's a really great book here. Um, by Ar Arthur Zions, who's a physicist, a quantum physicist, but he's also a spiritualist, and it's called uh, When Knowing Becomes Studies, Physical Reality, and How Our Thought Impacts Our Physical Reality. Okay, lots of good practices in there. Arthur um, who? Um, Arthur Zions, and I, I don't think his book's in the list, but the last name is spelled Z Z A J O N C. Okay. Good. Um, there's this little book here that's a little gem by a Canadian scholar by the name of Jean Vanier. Uh, it's called Becoming Human, and he started uh, many years ago. He started Larsh Homes, and Larsh Homes. He uh, envisioned a world where people with intellectual disabilities would not have to be institutionalized. He envisioned that in a time when all people with intellectual disabilities were institutionalized. And so he, large homes and communities are worldwide now. And these are places where people with intellectual disabilities can live in community, normal lives in community. It's amazing. And this book is all about becoming human and, and our emotions and our morality. Um, this book is it's huge, but if you're interested in, look at how big it is, <laughs> just a little light reading. It's, <laughs> it's called uh, The Empathic Civilization, and it's by a scholar by the name of Jeremy Rifkin. There's nobody on the planet that knows more about empathy than this guy. He has studied everything to do with empathy and our capacity for empathy. And you don't have to read the whole thing, you can look, you know, it's one of those books where you can look up specific bits that you're interested in, but it's fascinating, fascinating. So, yeah. It's called
called the empathic civilization. By Jeremy Rifkin. And we'll have all these I think some of these are on the resource list. I'll, I'll show you a couple of other ones that I've got here. Um, this is another good one here, The Age of Empathy. It's by Franz, another uh, scientist, scholar by the name of Franz de Waal. And he studied um, empathic behavior or moral behavior in chimpanzees. So I figure if they have the potential, then we do too. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one, uh, this is a really old version. It's now blue, and you have to order it right from him. But um, Gregory Cayetti is an indigenous scholar out of the US. Uh, he's got, got a PhD, and he wrote this book called Look to the Mountain. And it's a wonderful um, look at indigenous life ways and, and reasons behind some of those life ways. So he gives you a really good sort of universal look at why did, why did we do the things that we did? Why was place important? What about mythology? What about whole person development? And, and these sorts of things. It's a great. I, I, if you looked in this, look at all the stickies on the side. I've read and read and read this book. I, almost the whole book is underlined, so I should have stopped underlining at some point because now I don't know what to look for. <laughs> okay. Um, and then this one here, which probably many of you have seen by Rupert Ross. He has a series of them, but this is um, in, called Indigenous Healing, the best one, and it's a, it's a good one as well. There were more, but I couldn't bring my whole library. I can't lug my whole library around with me. <laughs> so these are some of the scholars who've informed you know, my knowing uh, in regards to these subjects and have helped me make sense of my own lived experience. So how did you, this is a bit off topic, but how did you bring theoretical physics into indigenous ways? It's interesting because I've been fascinated by that for about 10 years now. Well, and lateral kindness. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I mean, it's always been, um, um, quantum physics has always been part of my understanding um, mm -hmm. for many, many years. It's always been of interest to me. Uh, but Kayeti also wrote a book called Native Science. And so he and another group of indigenous scholars sat with physicist David Bohm to talk about um, indigenous life ways and as a, as a valid science that's actually <laughs> Quantum physics now is just proving what indigenous yeah. people knew in the long ago about the manifestation of reality. They're just catching up. <laughs> <laughs> Science is just catching up, yeah, into a, to indigenous ways of knowing. So it's yeah. wonderful, yeah. and it's, it's incredibly empowering to know that what you think uh, affects your reality. Hugely. Now we have to, well, those of us who sit and we think this way, we're called thought leaders. Thought leaders. So choosing to look for the good, choosing to be grateful, thankful, transfers into encouraging Have, others. Having all that, like this, I think it's, we have to have the sacred practices that are humbling and keep us tapped in. Yeah. And then we have to know that, that we have the power to vision and that's what Vision Quest is all about. Is our, our, the vision is so important that we have the power to vision a new reality for our, our communities and our future. But we have to dare to go there and we have to see ourselves as that powerful as well. So we're going to be wrapping up. Is, is there any last questions, comments, before we talk about what we have coming up? Okay. And Judy, Charlie, um, and Lake Bevy. One what is an appropriate way of grounding oneself? Well, I know I have my practices, and I think that people, you each need to find your way, a way that will work for you. And for me, I meditation has been profoundly helpful for me. So I sit a minimum of 20 day, 20 minutes a day in meditation, and I do a focused meditation. Uh, 
um, which means I vision in my, in my meditations. But walking in nature um, is also uh, a practice that, that I embrace. And every day when I wake up, I open the curtains and I, and I, I just intentionally greet the day and I'm thankful for my day. I'm thankful for another day. And um, breathing, I think, is really important. I, I, we, we breathe in and out 21,460 times a day. And uh, every time we breathe in and out, we, it's an exchange of life breath and it's sacred. And I think if we can become mindful of what we're thinking when we're breathing in and out, that that can be incredibly grounding. And so go back to your breath and, and focus on that when things start to get a little crazy. And, and just allowing, you know, most of us don't, and there's all these funky ways of breathing that they teach in meditation, which I don't like, mm -hmm. to try and control your breath. The breath should be the most natural thing on earth for you. It, it's life breath coming in and out of you should not be contrived and so if you think about it like um you know a bellows for a fireplace the thing that you go like this to get the fire going do you know what i'm talking about Yo, yeah. Oh, yeah so when you think about a bellows what's pulling the air in through the nose is the bellow right so yeah. bellow and belly mm -hmm. our breath shouldn't be orchestrated like by pulling it through the nostrils it should be orchestrated by pulling it through the tummy and filling our tummy up and then it will automatically, it's this automatic thing. And so focusing on the breath and the exchange and I always say when I breathe, it's like I'm breathing the, I'm breathing the big me in, creator in, right? And then I'm, I'm breathing out and when I breathe out, I'm, I imagine I'm connected with everything on the out breath. In and then out. Um, that has been transformational for me, just, just getting attuned to my breathing. So if someone has never meditated before but they're interested in learning more, yes. is there any direction you could like any resources as an indigenous person where you could direct them? Well there's all sorts of different kinds of meditation you yeah. can do. I mean it's it, it's and, and I had recommended the book by Zion. Mm -hmm. So there's some great contemplative practices in there. Um, I, I think I want to be careful because I think people have different beliefs about different things and so I don't, I, I don't, if you're, if you're interested, you can email me and tell me what you're interested in and I can make a recommendation to you because there's all sorts of different ways you can do this. Meditation can be done through art, it can be done through life writing, it can be done in nature. It doesn't have to be a sitting meditation. You can do walking meditation. Um, there's many, many different way, forms and different traditions. So you have, I mean, there'll be some traditions rooted in indigenous life ways. There's, there's Buddhist traditions. Um, there's Hindu traditions. Um, there's Christian traditions. And, and so I think today what's happened with the um, popularity of mindfulness is that people are doing mindfulness practices, but they're completely disconnected from tradition. And I think if you're going to do a practice, you want to know what tradition you're practicing. I think that's really important. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Is, as we uh, wrap up, is there any other questions or comments? Everything good? Would you like to say anything in closing before we go over our next sessions? Um, well, I think I just really enjoyed uh, this session today, and I thank you. You've been a wonderful audience, and I, I hope I've given you some value uh, just in sharing what uh, the little bit I know about this. I, it's a vast, it's a vast subject, and I just encourage you all to see yourselves as 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 big spirits, capable, and and find that vision. Find that vision for yourself, for your organization, and, and believe in it, and, and work towards it. That's, I think, the most empowering step you can take. Thank you very much. Um, coming up, we have some sessions that I encourage you to register up for. We have another youth circle, and it's on healing, tools, and methods for youth. Um, we're going to have part three of this nonviolent communication. And for transforming, sorry, for transforming conflict, and it's going to be called uh, non nonviolent communication, and that's February 18th, and the youth circle is February 16th. Um,
we have another one on co-occurring disorders, and uh, that's on February 23rd, and BC Early Years uh, Center Network, and that is going to be February 24th. So have a look at our Learning Circle page, and I encourage you to join us again. I want to thank you so much, Denise, for being here, and I thank you, Leah and Davina, for an um, incredible team. And thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, Hi, Mary Knowles. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see me.